Five years ago, the Supreme Court ruled that the key tenets of the Scottish Government's named person scheme were unlawful. We're looking back at that long road to victory by speaking to those involved in the successful No to Named Persons campaign, from the legal team to those blazing the campaign trail. One who was speaking out against the scheme in Holyrood before many people even knew about it was Conservative MSP Liz Smith. Currently, she is Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Economy, but at the time she was Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills. Liz, thank you for joining me. How did you get involved with the campaign? Were you prompted by some of your constituents or, or did something else make you want to get involved? Um, I, fr I first got involved really because I picked up what was going on in the petitions committee at Holyrood at the time and I had some concerns about uh, the sort of named person aspect of the potential um, legislation that might come uh, after the petition. But as that developed, I certainly was contacted by um, several constituents, mainly parents, and then obviously by people who were very concerned about the practical implications of that. And, you know, in the, in the first few months, um, uh, I, I don't think there was um, any sort of, well, in, ter in terms of media input to it or whatever, I, it was fairly slow just to pick up, but I was keeping a very close watch on what was happening. And I, um, at one of our uh, shadow cabinet meetings in the, in the party, I asked uh, for a discussion between our um, colleagues and there was quite clearly um, some concern amongst other of, of my own uh, colleagues in the Conservative Party. And therefore, you know, it was an issue where I, I thought we were going to have to uh, take uh, quite a lot of time just to um, ensure that we knew exactly what the detail was. And uh, so I started doing quite a lot of work on the possible implications of this and just um, started to express my concerns. And obviously it's on the parliamentary record. Um, which you can um, dig, dig back to for quite a long period of time as to exactly everything that I said about it. But I was getting increasingly concerned. So back in early 2014, it's fair to say that you were one of the only people really speaking out against it. Is that is that right? Yes. I mean, I think, you know, I, I was obviously the education spokesman uh, for the party at the time, and therefore it fell to me to make sure that we were putting a case of as to why we were concerned. And, uh, you know, I... I was prepared to listen to those uh, in other political parties who felt that, you know, there were good intentions behind um, the sort of Gerfic approach and that the named person policy um, might might be something that actually could help um, in terms of um, children's uh, well-being and looking after their best interests. But I, I had um, very considerable concerns about just what the implications could be. I, I didn't like the definition of uh, the, the well-being aspect. In fact, I, I don't really think there was an adequate definition for well-being. And that was something I raised in Parliament too. Um, but I was getting very concerned about some of the uh, language that was being used um, by some groups who felt that, you know, this was a, a very important step for, for every child that we had to have a name person. I, I just couldn't get my head around that. Um, and it was after that, as you know, that um, many people, um, whether it was Institute, uh, Christian Institute or various other people, uh, started to get very involved in the process and approached me and th th they were quite uh, keen to start a campaign. And I, I was um, very receptive to that. And I can remember speaking in the McDonald uh, Hollywood Hotel just behind me here, um, uh, at a, quite a major event, which which drew, I think, somewhere in the region of about 150 people in uh, just to listen to some of the concerns. Um, you know, people like Maggie Mellon, who was obviously a very um, well-known and distinguished uh, social um, worker, knew, knew all about these issues. Some uh, teachers, Christian Institute, some of the people who um, had uh, looked at the issue from a sort of homeschool angle. Um, but also uh, polit some politicians were just starting to get a wee bit anxious about it. Uh, so there were lots of people involved in this campaign against the scheme, uh, but you have a different perspective really because uh, you were actually in Hollywood when this was being debated. Uh, you've touched on it already, but what was the general feeling among other politicians there at that time? 
I, I think a lot of people felt that I was making um, a mountain out of a molehill, that you know, the intentions of this bill were, were nothing sinister, nothing, nothing to be concerned about. But I'm afraid that just made me um, more intent on finding out exactly what was to be involved. And um, as time went on, as you know, the, the No To Name Person campaign um, group, uh, they organised various activities around the, the, the country. And I participated in, um, I think, four or five of these where we, we got together an audience of, of concerned parents. And But by that stage, there was just beginning to be quite an outpouring from constituents and from parents, and to some extent from uh, schools, about the practical implications, as in, you know, what, what was actually going to be involved in this, um, in terms of, you know, how is it going to work, and whose responsibility, and I think this is the key issue that really started to um, cause some concern in, in other groups that might have been persuaded of the intentions of the uh, proposal, they, they started to get very concerned about uh, the responsibility, about the legal uh, responsibility that people would have in schools. If you, if you were um, a named person, you know, how is that going to affect your work and how is it going to affect your interaction with other people? And what were you, what was the information that you were actually going to see? And were you going to be passing this on in a way that was compatible with, you know, data protection and all the other aspects? So I think it was at that stage we started to get a bit of a snowball effect about the anxiety uh, throughout um, and the press started to pick this up. Um, some of them, um, you know, were fairly uh, sort of strong in their in their own approach and language about what, what they you know, became known as the snoopers charter and all, all sorts of things like that. But m most of the press, not all of it, but most of the press started to be um, quite against this, as in you know, very concerned about the possibility of it being a sort of nanny state approach. This is where I became um, personally very concerned about what was going on, on on two fronts, really. Firstly, I became very concerned about the um, possible ethical issues that were involved, um, whereby I felt that some information could easily be passed between people who were supposedly looking after the well-being of the child that wouldn't necessarily be shared with the parent. That concerned me a lot. But there was a second angle where the, the, the resourcing, the money that was going to have to be uh, used in order to support this system was uh, going to take um, money away from uh, youngsters who were most in need. You know, to have a universal system uh, meant that every child was going to have to be um, looked after in terms of the resourcing, whereas I felt that money was best spent on those who were most in need. And so there were really two aspects to my own anxiety, firstly, the ethical one, and secondly, on the, on the economic front. Do you think that the perceptions of some of your colleagues uh, and some of those in other parties changed over time? Yes, very much, very much so. I mean, I sat on the education committee throughout this, and as, as we questioned the witnesses who came uh, to uh, Parliament to express their own concerns, and there were completely mixed views, completely mixed views. And probably at the start, the vast majority were um, didn't really feel that there were many uh, major issues, but there was always a small element who did. The balance then quickly shifted. And I, I felt that my colleagues in the Liberal Party, the Labour Party, and to some extent in the SNP, were starting to get very concerned about the practical implications. And there were a lot of people, for example, the teaching unions, who were starting to speak out about the resourcing of this and the fact that this could mean uh, that a head teacher's job, for example, um, or a guidance job could be much more bureaucratic and burdensome. There were questions about how would, how would people look after um, a child during the holidays? You know, there, there were all sorts of practical issues. And the more that that came out, the more that the parliament started to uh, object. And that was helpful to the cause. But I mean, I hope I was always quite balanced in my own approach that I felt it was necessary to take the evidence, listen to what people were saying, and at the end of the day to weigh it up. And I marshaled my, my own arguments, I hope, on, on factual information and on the basis of what uh, these um, stakeholders were telling me. Was that a shift a, a gradual move or more of an overnight change? Yeah, I think I think it was a gradual move in the first instance, and then suddenly it became a bit of a steamroller where people were beginning to think, 
this is not such a good idea after all. This is this is really going to be um, quite harmful. And that built up to the um, Supreme Court ruling, which I think was the start of the end of the, of the policy, to be honest. Um, I mean, I, I heard about it actually, the actual ruling, which I think if my memory serves me correct, was about the end of July. I think it was about the 30th, something of July. And um, I, I was abroad at the time and I, I got a call from a journalist to say, um, had I heard about the Supreme Court ruling, which I just had um, by looking at the uh, BBC online. And, um, you know, I was delighted by that ruling because it was it was very important, although it was only saying that it was the uh, data sharing aspect of the of, of the court case that you know was the problem. And it, you know, it was couched in the fact that the overall objective, of the policy had been benign. But nonetheless, this data sharing um, uh, aspect was was contravening uh, Article Eight of the um, of, of Human Rights, and therefore, you know, there, there was a real issue after that, and then the whole thing just, you know, got really big after that. And um, I I think Scottish ministers started to recognise at that stage that they were on a losing wicket because, um, you know, they tried to sort of change things around to uh, reduce the potential for as much bureaucracy and just to try and soften the, the approach but but by that time the damage was done to the policy and you know it from then then on it wasn't terribly difficult to <laughs> tell, tell ministers that this just wasn't going to work and um, by which time schools had recognized that it wasn't going to work and you know it, it, it has now died a death because it isn't working mm. and uh, you know i think that's uh, it, it i think our view was vindicated um, because of the reaction of people who were being asked to be named persons. Uh, you mentioned earlier about people from other parties being concerned about it. What about this campaign uh, united people with such different political views? I, th I think it's, it's a bit like, if I can just um, talk about it from the current hate crime uh, um, situation, because that's united people. I mean, it's had the same kind of um, input, um, as in very considerable input from the public, same kind of concerns, and it's united people from very different political and social perspectives, just as name person did. And I think probably it was the it was largely the unworkability that was key to this, that people felt that the more they looked at the name person policy and how it was supposed to work, the more they recognised this, this, this just isn't going to work and they could see the loopholes in it. And a lot of people started to get very worried about where their legal responsibility was going to lie should something go wrong. And I think it was that that really triggered um, the very strong outpouring of public opinion against the no to name person uh, policy. Now, we know that even after the result uh, was handed down by the Supreme Court, the Scottish government was still really keen to hang on to it um, and to make it work somehow um, even though really by taking out the data sharing aspect of it uh, it had been gutted really um, but there was more opposition to it in 2017 uh, when a new bill came through wasn't there yes absolutely uh, right in what you say there and um, I, I think as I say the damage had been done and when it came back to committee, um, you know, th th there was this approach from the Scottish government that we're actually going to try and water this down. That, you know, the, the Supreme Court had ruled that, you know, that the overall general principle was benign and it had good intentions. And, and up to a point, I can accept that. I, I understood where people were coming from uh, who said that. But the, the practicalities of the way that it was supposedly implemented um, it was certainly not benign, and uh, and that was the difficulty that really caused um, you know I, I mean I I can remember dentists and doctors and uh, all, all sorts of professionals telling us that you know that this is just not going to work, but the the watering down of it I don't think was going to work at all because I think what they were trying to do is to water it down within the same sort of original structure, and it, the original structure was what was wrong, um, and I still maintain that you know named persons for those who are, you know, why, why do you make a problem for a child when none exists? And by having a universal named person policy, um, that's effectively what you were doing, is to say that, you know, um, all youngsters are going to have some kind of problem where they're going to have to go to a named person. It's not like that. What would you say was your most memorable moment of the whole campaign 
and, and throughout the whole process. I was very pleased to hear um, when John Swinney announced to Parliament that, you know, this was not going to be uh, continued. And I, mean, I, I felt vindicated about that, that, you know, it had been a long struggle. It had taken a very long time to get to that point because um, it was basically seven years uh, that, you know, we had been very hard at work uh, to do that. And when he finally made the announcement that, you know, this was going to be um, pretty much ditched or put in the back burner or whatever it was, you know, that, that, that was probably the best moment because I felt that, you know, we had won the battle then, which I think we had. Liz, thank you very much for speaking to me today.